thank you all for being here, and hopefully we'll maybe have a few others come in. Um, I am excited to present this to the two committees, this, this sustainability um, planning process that we're going through right now. And um, as I just said to the Finance Committee, I think it is an opportunity not only to talk about, well, to talk about the sustainability process that we're going through as a new way to look at our fun, exciting discussion we've been having for six months about what kind of buses we buy. Um, in addition, in the um, in honor of Earth Day coming up, we have a display that Heather and Christina are going to tell you about to check out after this meeting. So, that's good stuff. So, go for it. Um, we are, as Brad said, bringing you this item today for, for a couple of reasons. One is that for the first time ever, we have actually submitted our sustainability achievements here at PSTA to the American Public Transportation Association for recognition as part of their sustainability <coughs> program. Um, also, uh, we believe this is timely, as Brad mentioned, because we think this is the appropriate context with which to discuss our bus uh, purchase plan. And then finally, it's, it's a great time since Earth Day is Friday. Um, <laughs> Now, what is sustainability? In short, it is uh, in, involved examining how we can be uh, financially, socially, and environmentally responsible <coughs> in our organizational decision making. We want to make sure that we can meet our needs of today without compromising our ability to meet the needs of the agency and the community in the future. And why is PSTA sustainable? Well, first and foremost, as the provider of public transportation services, we are sustainable within our community. Uh, riding public transit is one of the top actions a person can make to be sustainable. It helps to reduce the overall uh, uh, emissions in our environment and then also our, uh, our fossil fuel use. Also, uh, by providing public transportation services, we're allowing uh, our citizens to have access to jobs, the community, and healthcare and other, uh, and other needs, which increases the overall vitality of our community. Now that we talked a little bit about how PSTA uh, is sustainable kind of from that broad perspective, I'm going to hand it over to Christina, who will share the details of our sustainability planning at the agency level. Good morning, my name is Christina, and I'm going to be talking briefly about industry sustainability at PSTA, our approach, and our company. So PSTA has a fairly long history of commitment to sustainability, as we were an initial signatory of after sustainability. We have a sustainability policy, and we've incorporated several sustainability principles into our strategic path forward plan. We're taking a uh, traditional approach to sustainability planning by establishing a baseline, setting um, specific goals and priorities for improvement, and also um, evaluating and monitoring our progress towards achieving those goals. So as part of developing a baseline, we need to know some of our accomplishments, and PSTA is very accomplished just by the environment to a sustainable agency, but also um, socially and economically sustainable. For example, we have expanded our trans transportation disadvantage program, which allows more people to access transit. We also have an employee wellness program, which encourages our employees to be healthy, which is also sustainable. And it also includes our sustainable pay plan, which the board has been talking about for quite some time now. And um, has supported especially last fall with the purchase of seven new VAE hybrid buses. So, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Heather, who will talk more about how sustainability is incorporated in the future. Right, thank you. Um, all right, so if we want to look at how this sustainability approach can be applied to our fleet, uh, we would first establish a base and then identify ways to make improvements over uh, that baseline. So the baseline, for example, could be improving our, or our fuel economy, and then improving our fuel economy. And this was an idea that was mentioned uh, by Chair Gordon Rice um, recently, and so we uh, explored that further, and we'll talk to you about that here. It's important um, that we talk about uh, making improvements to our fuel economy over the entire fleet. We operate a fleet of 210 buses of varying sizes and types. We have small gasoline-powered buses. We have hybrid buses, diesel.
digital boxes, and then, as Christina mentioned, the new VAEs that will be here soon. We hope in the future to add battery-powered Proterra buses to our fleet as we are able uh, to do so. Um, okay, so one way for PSCA to be more environmentally sustainable would be to reduce our fossil fuel use and improve our fuel uh, we currently, at this year, 2015, had a fuel economy of our, uh, an average fleet fuel economy of 4.0 miles an hour. Now, we could be really extreme and say one way to do this would just be to eliminate all buses. So we decrease PSTA's fossil fuel uh, impact. Um, however, obviously, that would have a negative impacts from a social perspective for our community. We could go all electric buses and dramatically reduce the size of our fleet, but again, that would not help us meet the larger goals of the community for social sustainability. So we believe um, that the best way to approach this would be to look at improving upon our average fleet fuel economy over time in an incremental fashion. So we've talked a lot about our uh, fleet fuel economy goals, but PSD also has other sustainability-related goals. We are, one of the, the big ones um, you all have discussed a little bit and you'll see soon, is that we will implement our succession plan, which will help improve stability of the organization over time. Uh, we also want to continue providing the innovative transportation services that we've introduced over the last couple of years and expand ridership through those. Things like the Direct Connect program and the UMass program. And then we have some other internal goals such as expanding our wellness program and expanding our recycling program. So, just to kind of wrap this up, um, in May, you will be seeing uh, a five-year uh, capital budget, a capital program, and that will include this kind of bus purchase plan that improves upon our fuel economy while also balancing our social and financial sustainability goals. So we wanted to bring this to this time to kind of prepare you for that and that discussion event. And finally, please join us at our birthday event following this meeting. Public service announcement. Maybe, maybe describe what that is going to be. Well, we have a display of, uh, we have a Proterra bus display. We have our, one of our hybrid buses surrounded by a lot of cars uh, and then a demonstration of kind of what the emissions are for that many cars versus the bus. Yeah, and it also shows just how um, you can have 50 people in traffic and that's 50 cars compared to 50 people on a bus, which is a much more condensed space and would really, really suggestion if more people would ride in it. Thank you, Heather. Questions, comments, Mr. Chair? Uh, yes, hi. I, I'd like to know a little bit more about uh, the sort of target goal over and above 4.0 miles per gallon average fleet. But do we have a target number that we're moving towards in terms of uh, uh, longer term economy? Uh, well, we're looking at, um, we've kind of looked at this ACTA program as trying to, uh, we're, we've just submitted our achievements for the bronze level. We'd like to, if we wanted to go to the next level of the thing, we want to recognize that the silver level, level they expect to see a 5% from your baselines, and there's multiple other baselines too, it's things like recycling, and there's other things included in that mix. Um, so, you know, over a few years, 5% would be about 4.2. Well, and again, too, just to emphasize what um, the judge was asking, PSDA has a fleet of 210 buses, and this idea is about setting a fleet-wide target rather than an individual bus purchase policy on increasing fuel economy, which reduces, which is the way greenhouse gases are reduced. And we can just continually show regular improvement, because we buy buses every single year, of all shapes and sizes, and if we can keep that number going up from 4.0 every, you know, as our, as our goal, that, that's a sustainable program. And so it won't be, a policy that will come back to you with the capital program next um, uh, month with that we shall only buy electric buses, we shall only buy um, what diesel buses or whatever. It will continue to be a mix, but the definition of success.
success, as Commissioner Scott said, in the market is reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by improving our fuel economy, um, continually improving our fuel economy. Mr. Scott? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Heather. Great presentation there. The good thing is anything we buy now, any bus we buy, is going to be more fuel efficient than what we're replacing. Uh, what I think would be interesting to see uh, would be the fuel economy, we've seen a spreadsheet before that shows the number of buses we have by model fuel. So I'd like to see that with the average fuel economy for each of those model fuel buses and the average fuel economy of what we're proposing to replace them. So as we basically just kind of have a running mathematical average, if these fall off and these come on, you will be able to see that trend just clearly, just clearly. That's a great idea. still trying to get my arms around the concept that MPGs be so it makes sense conceptually, but what are we seeing about technology? And I know this is going to be a good decision, but doesn't the technology still matter in terms of emissions? Uh, it does, yes. Um, uh, certainly that is a thing that we, uh, we, I believe we already are on the forefront of. Um, and looking at these new technologies. But when you think about it, um, it as far as emissions, um, the, the emissions of a bus, the emissions of an electric bus, are generated based on consumption of fossil fuels. Right? So the electric bus, um, the, the, the vehicle doesn't consume a fossil fuel, but the generation of that electricity does generate some small amount of uh, uh, emissions. The hybrid bus generates, the hybrid buses that we have generate pollution, generate greenhouse gas emissions based on when the battery is not running the vehicle um, and when it's using its diesel fuel. Our small connector buses up in Northern Pinellas County are using gasoline. So any way that we can reduce uh, fossil fuel use 
which is increasing MPG, is by definition reducing emissions. There are new technologies that are coming on board with um, filters and uh, particulate matter traps and stuff like that that they're already using. Those, those have an effect, but those are on all the muscles, right? I mean, it, it's really just reducing our use of fuel um, over time. However, as we've been discussing, and really, I like the presentation, I like this little event we're having out there because in, in the broader scheme of our community, the, the number one thing PSPA can do to improve the environment is to carry more riders, get more people out of their cars. More, riding the bus instead of driving your car, like I did this morning, is the most environmental thing that someone in Pinellas County can do today. It is more environmentally friendly than reducing, taking all of your light bulbs out of your house and replacing with the CFC ones changing all of your appliances out and replacing with Energy Star appliances and increasing your thermostat so that you are hot. That riding public transit is more than all those combined the, as far as reducing greenhouse gases. And you'll see out there, as I think demonstrated as dirt, soil, 50 cars driving to PSPA today that park there is, what, 200 pounds of emissions uh, were generated? Versus the bus, which was nine, 20, and the and the Proterra, three. Uh, well, three I, I won't be around for this debate past October, but it, you know I, I like the approach, but it seems like we're saying we're agnostic on the technology. That, you know the old dirty diesels that we have can carry the same with people as new clean hybrids. Or I think the technology still matters in the long run. And I just, as I expressed to you when we talked about this interview, but I'm still a little bit concerned about that. CNG, for example, from what I understand, the emissions on that are not good. Right. And so folks are talking about CNG as, as one of the ways we can go out before, but in terms of emissions, it's not a good technology. Is that correct? Well, there have been some more recent studies shown that um, Greenhouse gas emissions, especially of CNG, are actually more than even the newer diesel um, engines. But, you know, certainly as Heather's presentation shows, it is a combination of sustainable, um, financial, environmental, social. So, PSBA moving forward will be looking at all three of those things. Technology is important, but it's, again, more important to have a sustainable financial plan and to keep the buses rolling, uh, picking up more passengers than committing ourselves to one particular technology just just because that is going to be that's not just a policy. I have a couple of questions that are on performance management. When does this come to
North County Connector Highway buses. Um, there will be gasoline or diesel? Oh, there will be diesel. They are gasoline today, but we're buying a little better version of a small vehicle. They have to be smaller than the regular bus to uh, do the deviations as part of the connector service. Um, so that, that will be the plan. We will be, uh, I think, recommending a mix of some diesel and some of these BAE hybrids that we are going to start in honor of Commissioner Barkley's uh, Chevy Volt, calling those electric buses as well, because they operate exactly like a Chevy Volt. Um, a little more detail, but it'll be a mix. And then hopefully we will be uh, successful at receiving some federal funds for our low no grant, uh, second time around, and uh, you'll be asked to approve some electric battery funds. Find um, with the small buses. Um, Thank you, Commissioner. Any other questions on sustainability? Great job. We do have uh, one public comment. Some gentleman named Bill Thomas. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank Brad Miller and the staff for setting up this great event out here in the parking lot. I encourage you all to join in that. Uh, it is Earth Day. Today is also the sixth anniversary of the Deepwater Horizon disaster, where 11 oil workers lost their life uh, out in the Gulf of Mexico, getting that precious oil that we really had to have six years ago. Good news is, since then, technology has come on. Cars and buses that use no oil. They did not exist six years ago. They do today. And you have a choice. We all have a choice as consumers and as public officials to choose the technology that eliminates our use of oil. Because as long as we're using oil the way we were, the oil companies will continue to push the drill on our beaches. They're pushing the drill off the beaches of the Carolinas and Virginia right now. They want to do seismic testing. They're still going to get to do that. So I don't know if you saw the story in the Tampa Tribune yesterday. It's nice to have two newspapers, uh, which looked at the research that USF St. Pete College of Marine Science is doing. We are very lucky. And we know that that can't happen again. But yet, as long as we're continuing to not embrace, not make the switch to the new technology, we will continue to create market demand for that oil drill. I heard a discussion just now about emissions. Diesel bus, 3,000 grams of carbon per month. CNG bus, 2,800 grams per month. Diesel hybrid, better, 2,300 grams per month. Electric bus, even with the Duke sources of electricity and what the utilities are doing now, and burning natural gas and coal and a little solar and a little wind, 650. So about a quarter of what you've got from DC. That is today. That 650 is going to decline, we know, as we move to more renewable sources over the life of the buses that you're going to buy this year. Whereas the 3,000, 2,300, whatever it is, is going to remain the same for the next 15 years. So here will be in 2032, with whatever you choose to buy this year, still running on the roads. I think it's great that the Proterra bus is here. This will be the fifth electric bus, zero emission bus demonstration you've had here in the last year. Please go out there and look at it. And if you don't have time to really satisfy all your questions, you have more questions, or you want to take a ride, please go to St. Pete Earth Day, Williams Park, you know where that is, Saturday, all day, the Proterra bus will be there in the 4th Street North Lane, and they'll be taking rides around that. Please check this out. They'll be over at USF St. Pete at the Center for Urban Transportation Research this afternoon at 4.30, doing a presentation there. They'll be at the Kennedy Space Center at their Earth Day event. So thank you, and uh, check it out. Thank you, Mr. Compton. Thank you. How long will that bus be here today? It'll be here until 1.30, I believe. Okay. Chairman Parker, has a question for you. Yes, Mr. Compton. Yes. Uh, Mr. Compton, um, I would just ask your organization as a leading social force in this area. Two quick things. Number one, what can you folks do to uh, cause Duke and other vendors of electric power to use more environmentally friendly power sources like, like solar and wind and so on? That's number one, because you folks
can we do with regard to the biggest problem that we're facing right now, my committee is facing right now, with regard to purchase of electric buses, which is a consistent method of producing uh, battery charging operations, because each vendor right now is providing a separate and uh, separate source for charging. It, therefore, once we make a commitment to a particular vendor, we're sort of stuck with that vendor because we can't change to another vendor without changing to an entirely different charging mechanism. If there's a standardization of the charging mechanism, then we could year to year, uh, committees like myself, my committee, all across the country could uh, uh, actually take competitive bidding on the buses and drive the prices down. But right now, once we make a commitment to a particular vendor, we're stuck to that vendor because each one of them has a separate charging device. Yes, I believe you are correct. Uh, on that second question, I would say please talk to the representatives of Proterra who will be here today, talk to the people from BYD, from Think Coach, Newswire. I understand that they are working on that sort of solution for that issue. Well, the reason I asked you the question to you is because you guys are at the forefront as far yes. as driving that conversation. Right. And so they'll listen to you a lot more than they'll listen to me. Well, we, we're not going to, Sierra Club isn't going to buy any buses from them ourselves. So I think they'll probably listen to you. <laughs> but yes, absolutely. We're, we're talking to them about that and making that clear. Uh, on the first question, uh, most of the work of Sierra Club around the United States is to encourage utilities to shut down coal fired power plants that in many cases the utility has too much capacity, they don't need to burn that coal anymore, and to move not just to natural gas, but to move to renewable sources. That is the primary work of Sierra Club does. And we will we'll be doing that work from, as we have been from our office in St. Petersburg the state. So it's very important to us absolutely. But just bear in mind, the net pollution is still about a quarter today. And it's only going to get better. Thank you, Phil. Any other questions? I really appreciate it. We'll move on to our action items. Thomas Mann, if you free to stick around. Um, action item for March 16th, uh, meeting minutes. Any corrections on that? Uh, is there a motion to approve? Is there a second? second. Okay. All in favor? Meeting minutes are approved. We now move on to item five, information items in the uh, October 2016 service improvement. Good morning. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. There is a lot of information here. This is an information item, and we're talking about the um, the process that we're going through at this time. I, I believe that these were the, these are big files, so I believe they were emailed as a link earlier in the week. So, um, uh, but yeah, we'll we'll make sure because there this is a this is a big this is a big deal for us. This uh, these service improvements. Um, we've been talking about. Um, making changes to our bus system and the way that we serve our customers uh, for a while now. Um, for those of you that were on the board in uh, 2013, you know, we did a very extensive look at all of the routes throughout the system through the community bus plan, and we had a very robust public engagement process that we went through in order to get some comments and suggestions from our riders and the general public about how we should serve the community. Um, we got some really good ideas uh, about what people wanted to see, and we came up with some scenarios to build those into the system. The fundamental part of what we were trying to do with the community bus plan is um, achieve some efficiencies. 
And that's also reflected in how we moved forward with the path forward um, and that customer-oriented service redesign. And so this becomes part of our work plan um, for achieving those efficiencies, but also ensuring that we are serving uh, the people who are, are riding our system. So we talked about a while ago a 10-phase plan of putting these service improvements um, in place. And we started down uh, that path um, and said, you know, we really need to do this a lot quicker. And so we came up with a three-phase plan. Um, we've been through a discussion of the, some of the inefficient routes, um, and we have celebrated the uh, change in downtown St. Petersburg from a hub system to a grid system, which was the microcosm of what you're going to see over this third phase, which is looking at the entire system. Um, we know that um, agencies around the country have, have taken a look at their systems and realigned their routes um, based on the data that they have and their community outreach. Uh, Two, two of them, um, Jacksonville and Houston, who have, have done this recently, um, also saw some increases in ridership because of the changes that they made. Um, so all of those things that we are looking at um, from the data side and the community side are put into play here, and the ultimate goal being serving our community better. And one of those ways that we're able to do that is to take those efficiencies that we create um, in changing the system and then put them back into more services on those later nights or the weekends, making our service a lot more consistent and then a lot easier to ride as well. And we've talked about then, then improving the system even further with some of our major projects. So with the service changes that we've done and the service changes that we're planning in both October and, 20, and February of 2017, um, by the time those are done, we will achieve those um, principles, for the most part, of the community bus plan, of creating that grid network that uses our resources efficiently, efficiency, um, uh, expanding span of service for selected routes, especially those that have the high demand, uh, and improving uh, weekend service co coverage. And you saw that a little bit um, with the uh, very successful change in, in downtown St. Petersburg, um, but this will hope you'll see this a little bit more throughout the entire system. For this change um, in um, October of 2016, and again, we are just starting to kick this off um, out, you know, looking outside of, of the agency. Um, we are um, just looking at the North County and some select mid county routes. And um, the reason is, and when I get into the data part of the presentation, you'll see there is a lot of data background, but there's also a lot of public engagement that we need to do. And in order to do a good job um, and do this all in-house, we need to focus on, on those areas. So what we've, we've focused on North County at this time, um, we are continuing to do the work um, in terms of the data side um, on the South County routes and uh, talk internally about um, uh, for the different departments about those routes and the things that we're, um, we need to, to adjust. Um, but in terms of implementing and talking to the public, um, we thought this would be a good way to have a focused conversation. So that 2016 um, October change, uh, we would primarily look at streamlining, um, removing uh, deviations that have been created over the years that may or may not be used anymore. Um, consolidating bus stops, and we've talked about this um, a little bit, is um, combining this with our shelter deployment so that you make a more attractive waiting experience, and we can able we are able to do that if we um, have those consolidated bus routes. Uh, moving our hours around to evenings and weekends where they're they're most needed, especially on overcrowded routes, and we have um, a couple of frequency improvements, but very few that primarily focused on that um, at evening and weekend. Uh, and, and we have some very specific proposals. I'm going to walk through just one example of, of the process that we're going through um, in the planning department scheduling um, and then how we're taking that out uh, to the public. And then uh, Bob Lasher will talk about um, our plan for that public engagement and what the next few months will look like. And again, this is just the kickoff. You'll see this again next month 
and then decisions in June. Right, that we're not, we have those um, six core routes, which are essentially eight corridors within the county that um, as part of the, the community bus plan new revenue scenario were our, our rapid bus and our um, BRT routes. So uh, we won't be able to put all of 15 minute service on all of those routes under under this plan because we're we're dealing with a, a different level of budget. Okay. So uh, the example that I'm going to sh show you today is the Route 62. Um, so currently the Route 62 um, comes up from uh, Ty the Tyrone area, um, used primarily using Belcher to uh, uh, to com com come over to uh, Safety Harbor around Philippi Parkway up to um, uh, countryside Mall, and then up to Boot Ranch. And so it does this little circuitous route, um, and there was probably a good reason that this was created at the time, um, but what we looked at is how can we streamline it. And our original proposal in-house was to take it up to Countryside, and that's it. Um, and we talked to a, a people internally, talked to our operators, and they said, we really need to get to Boot Ranch. And so we said, okay, let's look at taking it to Boot Ranch. Um, but at the same time, we're missing that piece to Safety Harbor now. So how do we take care of that? So we've examined the ridership trends and how people are using the system and said, well, if we extend the uh, Dunedin Palm Harbor connector, we can serve the people who are riding in that, in that area. And then so all of the same space gets covered. It just gets covered in a different way, and we're choosing a more efficient way to serve that little deviation. And so the information that we went through included just the general statistics of how the ridership trends uh, were going on the entire route, but then also how are people using this route very specifically? How are they transferring? Where are they coming to and from? We have done extensive surveys on that origin and destination uh, data, and then we plotted it on a map. We all took a look at it and said, okay, people are transferring as part of their trip. Some people are just using this. Um, but let's make sure that we keep those transfers uh, in close so that um, people can still continue to make the trip that, they're, that they need to take. We also looked at loadings. So, um, so when you get on a bus, you see you could get to Grand Central and everybody gets off. And then a whole new set of people get on. Okay, well, what that means is there are two different markets that you're serving. And so by looking at that data, we're able to say, let's look at this segment of the route separately from the other segment and see how we can better serve the, the people who are using each one of those segments because these two segments don't necessarily have to be connected if they're serving two different sets of people. And so we looked at those, those loadings and all the data that we have on that too to, to make some of these decisions about how we would continue to serve everybody uh, but do it in a more efficient way. So this is the overall uh, map of the routes that we are looking at. Now some of these will have no changes. We, we took a look at the route and said the route is performing fine and, and there is no need to make a change. And we said, and that's okay. Um, we're not here to make changes just to make changes. We're here to be as efficient as we possibly can. Um, so routes like the 78 or, or the 60, we said, let's, let's leave those alone. When you look at this map, you'll see that the coverage area is the same. And that was very important to us, making sure that people could still make their trip. But again, doing it more efficiently so that we can put improvements on certain areas where things are overcrowded. So the public engagement part, which is Bob's cue to come up and start talking, um, uh, was very critical to uh, the whole entire process. And we have a, a very specific list of people that we're talking to internally to make sure that uh, once the proposal leaves, that everybody here has had an opportunity to look at it. And so Bob will talk about that first before he gets to public. 
Thank you. I'm also going to put in a shame, uh, shameless plug for the community bus plan because some of you weren't here when we did this. Uh, God, it's almost four years ago now. I, I can't believe it. in 2012. When we did that, we went out all over Pinellas County to ask people what they want. Where do you want to go? When do you want to travel? Where do you need to go? What do you want from your transit system? And we got, and I know this is contrary to some people's belief out there, 44, no, sorry, nearly 4,400 pieces of feedback from the public who actively engaged us, whether it was filling out one of our surveys. We also had a money spending game to help them make it a little easier. How would you allocate funding for PSDA? And there were thousands more on top of that we talked to, but we had that input from nearly 4,400 members of the community to help build that plan that was the bus portion of Greenlight to take us whether, you know, whichever way the referendum went. And we, we have kept a lot of that moving forward now because this is what we want to do now with this redesign. Um, and we've also had some great input internally. It's not just about going out, but it's about starting with planning when they start to look at the routes and say, okay, we might be able to do this better. But then you have to go to safety, security, and training. You have to make sure that you can actually do it because you can look at a route and say, well, if we were on this route up here, 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 and it'd be great. And then you don't want to come day one and they say, hey, a 40-foot bus can make that turn. So it goes to them. They sign off on it. We'll make any more tweaks there. And then we start to take it to our drivers, supervisors, customer service representatives. They give us tremendous feedback because they're the ones that are on the street. And we'll make a few more tweaks. And then we start to take it out to the publics. So we take it out to the committees, our track committee, and we get their input. And we put this all together. And this is what we did for Williams Park. And by the end, we make sure that we're looking at everything we can to make sure we don't have some issues. Like we were going <clears> to <throat> take the 32 away from Publix in St. Pete before Williams Park. We learned don't do that. <laughs> Boy, did we learn don't do that. So we're basically doing the same thing, but it's on a larger scale because we're doing a larger issue. Uh, we're also meeting uh, most of this week, last week, in fact, we meet with county today with city and county staff. We'll have workshops, uh, and I'll detail this coming up uh, shortly to meet with the public. Uh, these are the city and county staff we've already met with. We've got uh, plan uh, Pinellas planning today. We're also going to have a few more. We've got to get in touch with Seminole, Largo, and Pinellas Park, but the changes there are, are going to be fairly minor. We've got workshops scheduled for the week of May 10th. Uh, they will all be in the evening, and that was done intentionally because that's the request we get. And we have them in the daytime. If people take off, they'll get angry at us. So we wanted everything in the evening and everything that is on a route that will operate that late into the evening so people can take PSDA to and from all of these meetings. And then the one that's earlier, that's a Saturday. That's here on a Saturday. So the people, if they, they don't want to take off during the week, they can come here and give us their input as well. And then we've got a couple of dates set aside if we need them for additional workshops or public hearings. July through September, this will be going on through the end of May into June. Uh, once we get the route set, then, of course, marketing, they, they start to ramp up and they do some of that great work like you saw with Williams Park because you need to have those materials to hand out. And then we will take that. We'll start with the driver and customer service training internally. And then about a week prior to the service change, we're going to have our ambassadors out again at the major transfer stations all around North County to let people know, hey, you may have to make a transfer. We might be splitting this route. It's going to be a little bit easier than Williams Park because most people are still going to have uh, smaller changes, but we don't want to catch them off guard. And, of course, we'll be there uh, once it takes place and around the county. We'll probably be riding some buses on some routes as well. And we will be out there in these yellow PSTA one size doesn't come close to fitting all vests. <laughs> and you can see that that vest fits Brad perfectly, so imagine what it's like on me. I was, I was seeing a soprano that week. And... Um, that's that's basically what we're doing with the outreach. I'll give it back to Cassandra. So you can see that uh, we've had a very thoughtful approach to putting this together. Um, and the, the meetings that we've had so far with um, the union and supervisors and safety, security, and training, as well as our city partners, have been incredibly positive. Um, people uh, both internally have made some changes, but we uh, overall they've said that the changes that we're making are good. Um, we even presented this to the track last night, and um, they were also very pleased with it. So there were two 
um, members of the committee that specifically mentioned that they ride the 62. One um, gets on at, at Belcher, and she was very happy with the streamlining. Um, the other would, is uh, in Safety Harbor, and uh, he said that the connector would, would meet his needs and, and he'd be able to, to do his trip, and he understands why you would want to put those efficiencies into the system. And so that was some good feedback about that specific route. Um, we brought the, the papers to you um, today so that you could look at, at the routes. Um, we will be taking those to um, a public engagement process, as, as, as Bob outlined, um, but we didn't necessarily uh, feel like we needed to go through every single one um, at this time. But most of the changes that we're making fall below the threshold for uh, a public hearing, and we want to get through the public engagement to make sure that um, um, we minimize the number of, of routes that would require a, a public hearing because, again, we're trying to make small efficiencies that have big impact. Well, thank you. You all have done an excellent job on this. Um, the graphics are very easy to understand. I've spent a lot of time on that. Bob, thank you for um, talking about the community bus plan because that was a great effort. It's still paying dividends for us. Um, since Debbie's at the front of the table, I have to ask, is this revenue neutral? Is this cost neutral? <laughs> uh, it will be it, it will be re revenue neutral. So we're looking at using the resources that we have within the system in order to make these improvements. We've made a through the the data um, exploration. We've made a list of things that um, we would like to improve: evenings, weekends on different routes. Um, I would say when you look through the um, uh, the the list. Um, one of the things that we talked about was on the 59, um, which in your sheet you'll see we've split the 59. Um, and, and in doing that, we're able to um, put the right kind of service between Gateway and uh, downtown St. Petersburg, uh, but then also improve some frequencies on the 59 in the east-west portion of it. Um, so um, while Debbie doesn't know this yet, our scheduling department does, and uh, they've working within their budgeted hours. Do you have uh, overhead capability in here? Can you show an overhead? Uh, no, we don't. No. Okay. Do you have this the Jolly Trolley Safety Harbor? Do you have a way to show this one? Um, I'll, bet, I'll bet we could. Maybe Bonnie can run down and put it on a slide. And yeah. Oh, they're in the Dropbox? Do you want to pull them up? Apparently we do. Yeah, you pull them up. Sandra, do you want to just describe it? What oh, sure. So um, the community bus plan recommended that regardless of the revenue scenario that we were working within, that the 66 and the Jolly Trolley be combined. Um, for, the, for the majority of the route, they do overlap already. And um, the service overlap is on the weekend, so uh, Friday, Saturday, and portions of Sunday. Um, the Jolly Trolley has more service on, on Sunday. Let me find this. Right. Go up. Scroll up. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I wanted to. There it is. Yeah. So um, we've made a list of um, items that we're talking to our uh, funding partners on the Jolly Trolley. So the original request for this was for this to become a seven-day-a-week trolley service. Um, we... Oh, the question was on the Safety Harbor Jolly Trolley. Oh, the Safety Harbor yeah, Jolly Trolley. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. That one. Yeah, that one. Okay. This is... Uh, yeah. I don't think we have the Safety Harbor Jolly Trolley listed, but the... This is the connector. This is the, the Dunedin Palm Harbor connector, not the not the Safety Harbor Jolly On Trolley. Side, okay, right, so I want to go further down. There we go, okay. Okay, so the uh, Safety Harbor Jolly Trolley is a partnership between um, the City of Safety Harbor and the merchants of Safety Harbor um, and PSTA. 
um, in order to uh, get some connection between uh, downtown Dunedin and uh, downtown Safety Harbor. Um, it's been running since February of 2014, is that right? 2014, and um, runs on uh, Fridays, Friday afternoons, Saturdays, and some Sunday service. Um, it does have a service development grant uh, that provides a half of the operating funding uh, right now, and we've been working closely with the um, uh, City of Safety Harbor looking at uh, both the merchants' um, interest and um, financial participation in the advertising um, as well as the ridership itself. So um, our proposal um, would be that we would replace this with the uh, Palm Harbor connector over uh, and allow them to have the Friday and Saturday uh, service. Um, Sunday, I, some of the merchants are not open on Sunday, so I think that it makes sense uh, for the service itself. They've been trying to change their hours a little bit to open on Sundays and kind of get more traffic. Um, but I think they're they're still trying to get their synergy um, as merchants about what they're going to do and what the downtown is going to be for Safety Harbor. Mr. Chair, this one is a little bit different than the other ones, as Cassandra mentioned, because it's funded currently 50% by a grant that is expiring. And Cassandra's done a really good job of working with uh, the city of Safety Harbor and talking about this future the Jolly Trolley Inc. and the in Safety Harbor. Uh, it's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but they've, they've already kind of broke the subject of when the grant runs out. It seems like the city and the merchants are maybe hesitant about doubling their contributions. And so this is a proposal um, in the event that we, do, we discontinue the Safety Harbor service once the grant runs out. So that safety harbor can still be served. We wouldn't discontinue it until the grant does run out, but it's good to get the public involvement and go through the process that Bob talked about just so we're prepared. And um, if they have a change of heart and they want to generate the funds, then we can Again, this, um, this allows us to have that weekday service, the connector. Um, is a replacement for the 62. And so that was the primary reason for the change to the, the Palm Harbor connector um, on that on that south uh, east end. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Well, this is more on the communication. Um, I'm wondering Yeah, we are. Yeah. Yes, we are. Yeah. We're the planning committee, you're, you're the per, you're, well, track this last night, but um, this is the start. This is the kickoff, yes. Uh, we wanted to, right. and that's great input uh, that you had to get other groups that we want to connect to in the next, before June, when this comes back to the PSP board, they'll come back to the planning committee before that again, but the, the action item to approve these changes Time starts now to June, and then as possible, the yellow messenger brigade goes out and uh, 
the information effort is both the public workshops were put the week before your planning meeting so that we could tell you what we heard over the course of the week. And you'll notice that Bob, in his infinite wisdom, did put one of the opportunities to talk to us on a Saturday so people could come and make sure that we are fully accessible to folks. Any other questions or comments? And I know Brad gave me a finger copy of this, but as you go out and talk to the community groups, they're going to be more interested in their segment, for instance, the HEP. What is the blow-up of that area? And I think that would be helpful. I'd kind of like to have a blow-up of that area myself just to be able to see in the finer granularity what's happening there. We will have boards at the public workshop, so much, much larger than a poster size of what we're proposing. I don't think there's a public workshop in Clearwater until June. Yeah, June 7th. When you when you go on, it's the it's the schedule, so it's the stick map. Yes. Yeah. We're we're working it. Yeah. Yeah. All and all of this goes into the Google Transit Planner too, so you.
priority. So, um, yes, so we'll, we'll, work, we'll keep working on that and empowering them uh, on making improvements there. Um, the Central Avenue uh, BRT is also moving forward. Um, there was a, a task force order that was approved for that project um, last month. We can talk with you by this week for a work session, and uh, we'll look forward to bringing a schedule to you of uh, public engagement. Um, we've also started to go out and talk to the beach communities. Um, we've completed two of those. Uh, Brad and Commissioner uh, Dighton uh, led those discussions to uh, Deer Beach and St. Pete Beach, and we have one scheduled with uh, the Federal Island in about a week or so. Um, I think we're going to have to have a, um, a ring built in PSTA, so we can have the city managers and the three beach communities come and duke it out and uh, see. Because this is this is one of the, the good things about um, about being a, a transit service. Something new is that everybody wants it, so um, they're really going to have to uh, fight for that uh, opportunity. Maybe you're related to things that have been done that, that uh, may have not been uh, fully accounted for. I think there's a lot of work that's been done on this already that can be uh, leveraged. Um, there is, there, that's, I think that's going to happen uh, pretty soon here, that they'll put that RFP out. Uh, but that study's going to take a while, and uh, while it happens, we'll uh, be careful, watch the eye on, on the, the results. Uh, but more importantly, um, and probably something that would happen sooner, is bus on shoulders. So the, we met with um, FDOT central office and uh, the district about the kickoff for um, the bus on shoulders project. Uh, I think this is going to be interesting. Um, we were the one of two transit agencies on the call, uh, us and, and Park, and we are the pilot project. Um, they're going to be looking at some policies for bus on shoulders throughout the state. Um, and they've made some recommendations so far that we think uh, they already they, they ought to change already. Um, and this makes the Pinellas segment from uh, downtown to Gandhi uh, an even more critical pilot. So 
So the recommendation that they had made is that the bus and shoulder would only operate on the right. Well, because we have left exits, that doesn't necessarily apply. And so we are, um, again, happy to be the pilot and also think that it solidified our position. This is a good decision for us to be the pilot uh, because it is likely that we would use the left on the southbound and the right on the northbound. Um, and then we, we can explore uh, those policies within the context of Maryland County. Um, so that, I think, will be a slow moving study simply because um, the other people on the call were other district, district offices from around the state. So um, everybody's going to have their nuanced uh, situation. And I think that, that uh, central office will have to work through that. Uh, but again, we're happy to be. Nellis segments of TBX are given. Um, I think the pushback that they're getting in the Tampa area is focused around the downtown interchange. Um, I don't know how quickly they'll resolve that, but phase one and phase two um, are in Nellis County, so we'll see their improvements uh, before anybody else does. Um, the other question about do I think they're dependent, and no, I don't, I don't think that they are dependent. Um, I think that uh, we want to have the opportunity for shoulder running options regardless. Um, and do you think that any improvements that they made uh, south of the on 275 um, need to have that option incorporated? So some a detail is uh, shoulders are built to uh, a four inch depth um, based on the uh, amount of, of traffic that they receive and you know, making sure that they don't break up. You put buses on those, you want those at a seven inch do we need seven inches in order to start operating those? No. Do we need seven inches eventually? Yes. So um, as they start to make other resurfacing improvements to the regular roadway, they need to take into consideration that improvement. So if we're at the table, that means it gets them. There's also a lane continuity study about 2005 that the department is uh, under, under, underway now. Shoulder operations will be enhanced by the safety of the overall configuration of the two sides. And we may actually push that. That project is not funded right now, but we may actually push some of the early improvements on that lane continuity because we would operate on the buses on the shoulder. Um, and, you know, the last project here uh, update is related to the MPO, so I'll just turn it right over okay. to our friend <laughs> Whitley. Uh, I will say that we've been meeting. Uh, monthly, and it's been a good opportunity for us to get some other things out on the table to make, to make sure that there are no surprises and have that in the yeah, I've been very proud. Just to add a couple things to what Cassandra was talking about. For State Route 60 and in that corridor, we have a scope of services that we are uh, developing for one of our general planning consultants to look at the downtown busway concept from downtown Clearwater to Clearwater Beach. And that would really serve the existing service that's out there and just provide preferential uh, connectivity uh, to address that big congestion issue. But the study is not just limited to downtown to uh, the beach. So we're looking at the entire corridor from TIA to the beaches. It is a multimodal corridor study, so we'll be looking at bicycle and pedestrian connectivity to transit, uh, as well as potential accommodations such as on Drew Street and other parallel facilities to make that corridor just work better, more seamlessly. Um, uh, traffic signal priority is something that we would have in our scope to, to be evaluated, and we'll be looking at that in partnership with PSTA because they may be providing some assistance for ridership forecasting. So I think it can be a really good collaborative partnership, and we expect to have that scope ready for review by PSTA staff maybe as soon as next week. Um, we also uh, approved, or at least worked together, to jointly develop a scope of services for a PSTA, what we're calling transfer area analysis. And it's not limited to necessarily the transfer points in the system today, but really looking at, kind of like Wayne Gretzky said, escape to where the puck will be. So as we look at the configuration of changes in routes, uh, where are the opportunities for enhanced transfer areas that can be truly mixed use from a development standpoint so we can begin to build that day-to-day -day ridership? 
uh, and also how do we um, maybe look at identifying connectivity and safety uh, projects that we can advance on the NPO side through either transportation alternatives funding or through safety projects with FTT. There's a larger pot of money. Uh, so that project we expect to kick off uh, in May and do the first half of it, phase one, to identify the opportunity areas in-house and then have a consultant help us with more of the master planning for those transfer areas so that we can provide information to local governments and developers and really I think that's the bang for the buck on this study is to really bring this to our local government partners to say where do you want transit to operate in your community and what does that look like and can we reserve space in your downtown building to have transit be a focal point of that downtown development. Uh, Largo comes to mind as a real good candidate for that. Uh, so those are a couple of things I wanted to mention. Uh, another one that may be of interest to you all is we are putting together a scope for Another one of our consultants to look at uh, land development codes throughout the county and how they treat accessibility, which I define as your uh, uh, opportunity uh, uh, to access destinations. And that's really more on the private sector side, but how do you get a patron to the front door of a building, uh, whether they're on a bike or they're on foot or they're, they park parked their car or they've taken a bus? And we have a lot of conflicts, I think, in our codes that prescribe a certain amount of landscaping, provide a, a, provide a certain amount of parking. And when you factor that in and take into consideration where garbage pickup is and freight drop-offs are, it doesn't leave much room for good at pedestrian accommodations. And we would like to actually turn that into technical assistance to then provide training for folks who are doing site plan reviews to really guide them on what are the best practices, not only that we see, because I think St. Pete is, is going to be a model uh, maybe a few other communities could be a model, but I'm not sure that even if you have good code language, that it's really being implemented. Uh, and then we have uh, some national best practices that we're bring to the table So I think those are some opportunities for some win-win um, uh, solutions. And then the last thing I'll mention is that we have July 29th, our joint board workshop, and we have to really plan out what that agenda is going to look like, but we need to start now because in May, we're going to be bringing to our technical coordinating committee at the MPO um, um, an item where we are going to suggest some changes in our project prioritization process that take the emphasis away from just adding roadway capacity and advancing those projects. We'd like to work that through our advisory committees for the month of May and June and then be ready to present a staff recommendation jointly to the two boards at the July workshop and then Whatever feedback we get there, we would then bring that to our NPO board in September. And that has a whole host of ramifications because I really firmly believe that our NPO has not yet fully embraced a performance-based, outcome-driven planning process where we look at Pinellas County and we say, these are the outcomes we want for our transportation and, and redevelopment uh, in our community. And how are we measuring that and how are we advancing projects that sign up to those measurements? And, and what the federal government has told us at the NPO level is you need to be able to demonstrate anything you program in your transportation improvement program that, it, that you're able to quantify to the extent possible how that's achieving your outcomes. Right now, I don't think we can do that unless we say our outcomes are um, elevating roads and reducing crashes at intersections. And those are objectives that are usable, but they're not objectives for everybody. Um, so I think that's going to be an important conversation it will also change potentially our transportation alternatives programs, uh, program so that we're not just funding a sidewalk here and a sidewalk there. We're really looking at projects that are about access to transit or that are about access to jobs. And, and I think something along those lines would be a better way of using our NPO dollars. Let the local governments fund their sidewalk projects. Let the NPO come to the table and bring something that's more strategic and maybe a heavier lift. We don't get a lot of money in that program, but I think if we're targeting those projects, uh, we could even say, let's require some level of match and do something as a bigger project. So lots on the table. Great. Thanks so much for the questions. I chat with you about 60 because you're talking about stuff that I wasn't aware of. Absolutely. Sure. Um, has any of you ever reviewed or you mean taking a look at the whole time to look? We've started to. Uh, 
uh, we had a presentation from Echelon Development, uh, which is really spearheading the whole effort, and just talked to us at staff level. Uh, Echelon is the name of the company. Oh, Echelon. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Cassandra was at the meeting, and they gave us a, a two-hour presentation, and we had a lot of Q&A. And um, we we're sending them uh, a few thoughts uh, about how to message that a little bit better. Um, I will tell you, my, my basic observation is I don't want that to take away from what we need to be doing just for the backbone of our transportation network. I think it's an important complement and addresses a, a real pinch point because those kinds of systems work in difficult geography, which we have going over the beach. Uh, it also works in constrained parking areas and constrained traffic ways. So I, I think it's a real potential success and could probably get up and running before potentially uh, we could do a busway, for instance, uh, just because we got different people to deal with all the money. But the caveat I have for that is that you're still going to have to get to it. And the pitch they've made to the city of Clearwater and the county, presumably, is a take or play plan, plan, plan which is demonstrate that you're committed to a million rides, and we'll pay for it. But if you fall short of that million rides, what's that dollar amount that the city and the county and whoever else would have to sign up to. And that's shifting the burden of risk right. to the public sector from the private sector. And I don't know if everybody's kosher with that yet. So that's a conversation we have. That's probably the biggest issue from our perspective is where that commitment of funding is going to come from. Because I think the concept in general is pretty workable. So for the clear water, clear water, clear water beach, what's the all of our estimate for the cost? Well, the original estimate from 2010 was about $15 million that was for not the, for, the, for the busway. For the bus for the busway. Are, are you talking about that or are you talking about the gondola? The gondola. Oh, yeah. Um, do you remember yeah, what he said? It was about three million? If I remember. That was the annual operating cost, I believe, three point okay. seven million. Yeah, annual operating cost. Okay. Just generally, I'm uh, very wisdom and I want to highlight and thank Wit for in addition to prepping for a really good uh, joint workshop with him to work. Also seeing him at our upcoming May 6th workshop here at ESPA where he is going to be part of part of the morning discussion with the ESPA board uh, specifically talking about some examples that I, I know they'll be great at doing um, showing the benefits of working regionally together at their time. So, stay tuned with that. Thank you, Whit. Cassandra, is there a number? $75 million for the capital. That would be a two mile system with three stations connecting downtown Clearwater to Clearwater uh, Beach. Uh, the annual operating cost was $3.7 million, and the expected uh, ridership uh, guarantee. developed a cost for the entire, protecting the entire county and even across the Howard Franklin. So there's a much bigger number out there. Uh, I'm a big believer of pilot projects. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the two mile segment seems reasonable. They've claimed that they will uh, pay for that uh, themselves. But again, that's that guarantee of a million rides. Well, and I think committees like this would agree that has to be part of the equation. And, and I haven't really heard that talk before. I think that has to be part of the equation. Uh, you know, we've talked
talked about those downtown parking garages as part of the Java Trolley uh, experiment uh, for this spring and potential additional service too that has been presented to the city of Clearwater at least. Um, I also think that there's a discussion to be had as far as the Bluffs master plan that the city of Clearwater is doing because that introduces some uh, interesting elements of site use and acquisition and transfer. Uh, so I hope that that study will run in parallel with ours so that we can be complementary with the city of Anything else? Commissioner? You extrapolate it out from the past couple of weeks. Yes. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that, you know, that's that's the challenge. Um, I mean, where you're dealing with water taxi operator, or you're dealing with the gondola, or something like that. How do you deal with that fallow period um, that we have for a few months? And increasingly, it's not all summer, um, but it's that May, September, uh, and, and and you're not going to have the same level of ridership that you're going to have during the week between. It did show a pretty high demand, and we want to go back and just really make sure that that's a good number, too. So that's something that at staff level, you know, I'm not sure how confident any of us are in that projection. And then next month, we'll bring to you some of the work that we've been doing with, with Jolly Trolley um, and some of the service agreements that we're looking at uh, for the connections from downtown to the beach in combination with the other services that they're providing. Um, we think we can get schedules are done right, we can get 10 minutes or less frequency on the grid, and that's without any additional resources that we're using today. So those are the kinds of shorter term solutions that we're working on, again, have to be part of an entire system.
primarily, not just, but significantly in the, the bus purchases. The other key item in that is our transit bus shelters. That's another key capital item. I know that the St. Pete City Council is having an item tomorrow that we're going to be attending so it's about, the, so about a proposal to change a 25-year ban on advertising of, on shelters in St. Petersburg to if they are provided by the private private developer. And a private developer has stepped up with this idea of a solar solar powered bus shelter that they would pay for as long as they get to advertise on it. Um, so that, that's on the city council's agenda for a lot of time. But we do have a, a shelter program to add shelter also in our town. So that's part of that. And then we'll get back to our prep for our FY 2017 budget with um, this committee planning our, our programs for the future with our personnel presentation. So these proposed shelters in San Diego, did you approve a good portion of the revenues from that Where are the revenues from? Uh, my understanding, and we've been having discussions thanks to your in intro um, to the gentleman, we've been having some discussions with them. My understanding is that the advertising by the private sector to construct the shelters. So but they pay for the shelters? They pay for the shelters and install them, but what they have been willing to do is take our list of uh, high demand need and and target their investments into where we, we recommend. Are you going to the meeting? The city council meeting? Uh, I'm hoping to go to the meeting and then that response.